You're simply educating the user on why this product exists, to whom is it for, and what problem is it going to solve. I've had a couple clients who came to us who had things like lifetime warranties. You, you are literally subsidizing a lifetime warranty. Literally 10% of your users knew about it. Yeah. Written, not even iconography. <laughs> so it's like use the power of visual iconography and talk about whatever that is. It can also be things that you, like, you're proud of as an example, right? So I've got a number of like really fast growing clients that are female founded and there's, and as they should be super proud, they put female, that great? Put that yeah. right on there, absolutely, right? You don't have to worry about what the, the value prop icons, just highlight what you are proud of about the product. Welcome back to a new episode of Chew on CRO, where we break down what's going on in the CRO world so you don't have to. Ned, what are we getting into today? Let's do some case studies. Let's do it. Right? Let's talk about a couple things. Some of these are going to be, I want to kind of dip our audience toes in here first, just mm -hmm. gently to get through some very basic ones. You know, over a couple episodes, we'll get into some very complex tests too. Uh, the more complex, the more specific it is to the brand. So mm -hmm. I, I want to avoid some of the really complex ones at yeah. first here, because what I don't want people to do is say, oh, that was really neat. Let's go do it. It's like, whoa, you got to do a lot of data analysis <laughs> to make sure yeah. your brand is is primed for something right. like that, mm -hmm. right? Because right? it's going to be, it's going to vary dramatically based on not the least of which what you're selling, mm -hmm. uh, but also your AOV band. And of course, the big one is your consumer archetype, right? But mm -hmm. let's talk about a couple that are generally speaking, highly applicable to a lot of different brands, right? So the first is, let's talk about landing event, predominantly mobile. The vast, vast majority of brands are all mobile centric these days, that's right? right? And that's right. just consumer behavior. We all know that. So what do users do? Right. One thing I talk about a lot is over the last uh, about two ish years, just personally and independently internally within the agency, I've done a lot of uh, studying of what brand new user behavior looks like agnostic to brand across. I think I did 100 brands, including this was about 10 to 12 million users. Wow. And so what I found is there's some very consistent things that new users do and do not do that are a little surprising. Mm -hmm. um, there's a bunch. Let's talk about one of them. The vast majority of new users on a site, when I say new users, I mean first time coming to your website, they will go to the hamburger menu to start their session. Mm -hmm. Right. A lot of times we put disproportionate amount of effort and attention into the hero banner and the, the color of the CTA on the hero banner and the below the fold and all this stuff there. Most users land and just beeline it right for that hamburger menu and they will determine obviously where they're going to navigate. But what I found is a lot of the site abandonment rate happened when people had the hamburger menu triggered open, which says what? They're judging the entire future experience based on what they see in that mm -hmm. hamburger menu. Mm -hmm. So I'm basically trying to say hamburger menus are really friggin' important, um, right? And they've they've frankly been quite archaic. Like they yes. haven't really evolved much since mobile centricity became like a prominent thing. 12, 13 ish years ago, really, with the advent of the smartphone and, and right. getting into actually using mobile devices for for e commerce. So. Right. Um, so with that being said, you know, just not the least of which we have to spend a lot of time and attention on our hamburger menu, right? So. One of the tactics that we've deployed, and we have a ton of clients that we've done this with, and it's been one of the biggest disproportionate wins that we've had, is getting into mobile visual carousel navigation, right? So in that case, what I mean is, as an example, you can see on the screen, I do have this highly redacted, just so everybody knows, because I can't show the specific, because I'm about to show you intimate data, so yeah. I can't mm -hmm. show you the specific brand that this is. Mm -hmm. However, you understand that, like, in addition to having this hamburger menu, you've got some of these visual cues that live below that navigation. Mm -hmm. Um, that works for a myriad of different reasons, yep. right? Not the least of which is it reduces clicks. As you know, there's always an inverse relationship in the number of clicks in any digital funnel and the conversion rate of that funnel. So you're always trying to shave clicks wherever you can. Hamburger menus are super high click, right? right. I had one brand I audited last week. It took seven clicks from the landing event going via the hamburger menu to see a product. So you had to click to open the hamburger, then click to get into shop, then click to go into macro collection, then click to go male versus female, then click to go into sub collection, and then click to go into, it was just like, yeah, it's just like, <laughs> whoa, you know what I mean? And I understand the logic tree and the hierarchy yeah, of decision making yeah. there, but that is, is inversely related to, generally speaking, user experience and conversion data yeah. on doing the one thing we care about at this step which is just getting someone into a product experience. Mm -hmm. That's all we care about. Now, the, obviously, if it's a landing page, it's a little bit different. But in this case, we're just trying to get them off the homepage and into a shopping experience, right? right? So 
And generally, by reducing click path, you're going to see benefits there. Kind of the big obvious, you know, benefit to this too is it's it's visual, mm -hmm. right? So I mean, imagine that you you immediately land in your uh, fashion brand, Notorious, right? And you yep. see the different vision. Immediately, you can start to answer the fundamental question you have as a user, which is, is this for me? Yep. Right? Can I see myself wearing it? We all have different styles that we like and dislike, right? It's highly subjective, and yes. so you can immediately make some of those decisions. You can also understand the breadth of products. That, oh, they have this. They have that. Yes. Oh, they don't just have. They got denim too. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, got it. So you immediately can get this visual understanding. People also hate reading. They're, they're notoriously new users are notoriously lazy. They will not read. So mm -hmm. all those big content blocks that you have to introduce a product, you could pretty much assume most won't even read it. Mm. Um, so again, just kind of going to the old ethos of like visual tends to do better. And then lastly, it's like a really ergonomic feature. I mean, you see this on on a bunch of different sites, right? I mean, if you want to, um, uh, I mean, you just browse around, you're going to find uh, a myriad of our clients honestly have this. And so it almost beckons the thumb click. It kind of like invites it in, right? Yeah. right? It almost has this like haptic, like you should just click on this, yeah, right? Yeah. We're just hammering hamburger menus, think about it, most people are right-handed. Hamburger mm -hmm. menus tend to live in the oh, top left. Yeah. Kind of an awkward click, tends to be left justified when it opens up. Yep. Mm -hmm. Often tends to have very small font that's not uh, ergonomically designed for a thumb click. And I got a fat thumb, right? So like when I go to click, I might hit like two lines at once. It's just not great, right? Mm -hmm. And so you take all these little uh, inefficiencies and then you rectify that with something like a visual carousel here. Mm -hmm. So obviously uh, you'll see different results from this depending on the brand, but like here's an example of one uh, where you can see conversion rate went up four and a half percent, revenue per visitor increased by 11%. Part of that came mm -hmm. from just getting more of these high value, high uh, intrinsically curious customers just down funnel into a shopping experience. Frankly, this brand I didn't think did a great job portraying their value props out of the gates, mm -hmm. but when you got into the collection product pages, you really Really got wowed. Right, so mm -hmm. to me, it was like instead of doing this whole exercise, right, on overhauling the home page, let's just give them better navigation. It's yep. a faster, simpler, more intuitive test to prove that original hypothesis, which is the more PLP and PDP view they get, they're probably going to convert better, and it turned mm -hmm. out winning, right? So pretty big brand, uh, obviously very substantial revenue lift that came from that, and you can start to see kind of the statistical significance on it. So when you're looking at some of the original control group, I mean, at no point did it ever even really come close to winning in this as we were progressing along, right? So good, good example there where a lot of brands should just kind of take a step back and just talk about navigation. Navigation is critical, absolutely imperative. Um, I won't show a case study slide on this, but we talk a lot about bestseller prioritization. Mm -hmm. Right. Another, just again, basic tenet, right, which is, you know, you 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 go to a new restaurant and you sit down, right? I just, I just, you know, literally last night, you sit down at a new restaurant and you look at this menu and they've got, you know, 20, 30, 40 options and immediately you're like, what's good here? Yep. What is this place known for? You yep. might just say, what's most popular, right? It's a shame to go to someplace and they're like, oh, you didn't get the, the famous yeah. ravioli. And you're like, come on, like no yeah. one told me yeah. that yeah. that was the best dish. Yeah. So, I mean, but that's why we'll like head to Yelp while we're sitting there. Yeah, sitting <laughs> right, the and you're like, all right, what are yeah. most, what are people getting? Right, mm -hmm. right. What looks visually most appealing? Totally, you know, totally. Um, so it, you're looking for that compliment right there. Exactly, it's exactly what you're suggesting to do on your site. Exactly right, exactly. And like you know, it's funny with restaurants because like in reality, if they wanted to be super non-branded but super UX centric, they'd all be like Chili's with like yeah. visual, yeah, with visual with photos <laughs> you know, of like every item. Yes, you know what yeah. I mean? But obviously, it, it comes yeah. across whatever. So so some of the best restaurants I've ever seen where where and again, this is not an empirical data point. This is just my personal experience. This is anecdotal that I've I've probably been upsold the most mm -hmm. is where the waiter was highly trained to mm -hmm. be like, welcome, da, da 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 Just so you know, this here, absolutely one of the most popular yes. items. This one of our most popular. And if they're really good, they'll be like, we only have a few left tonight. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm like, man, this guy yeah. read my playbook and is pulling it on me. But it works every time, yeah, it does. you know, or then it they does. come in to give they give their recommendations. If you're going to get that, I really recommend with this wine. It pairs beautifully. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then this dessert. This just happened to us last night that they'll say something like, you know, this is our most popular dessert. We need 30 minutes to prepare it. Yeah. Do you want to let us know? And again, but they ask you that before you started eating the appetizer. <laughs> Why? And I don't know if he did this on purpose. Come it was in. brilliant. <laughs> but it's like, you're doing this when I'm most hungry. So this is something like chocolate souffle yeah. thing. Yeah. You know, and you're and you're like, that sounds nice, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, if you ask that right after you just crushed, you know, a, a ribeye, you might you might not be as inclined yeah. to, to go for it. Yeah. Brilliant. So yeah. I, I'm getting on a whole tangent here, but no, in any event, makes I just, I love behavioral psychology. He's thinking about the chocolate yeah. souffle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But point being is, is again, this all kind of reverts back. This isn't magic. This yeah. is just pertaining to basic tenets of behavioral psychology. But, we, but we've done, we, I feel like sometimes we've known these things, but we don't apply it to the broader scale. Like 
I, I remember when we used to do like product images too. Mm -hmm. um, we'd put little starbursts that yeah. say bestseller, yeah, or yeah. top seller, yeah. or, or or customer's choice, yeah, mm -hmm. right. And you're kind of again basically saying just applying this on the broader scale through the navigation piece for too. sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, don't just let it live in the collection area. Correct. Or you know, and, and I think the theory makes sense because it is what we've been doing. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Know? And people want they want to get to just they want to get settled in. They want to get comfortable with it. So it's a great thing you can do. So suffice to say, here's one example navigation but strongly recommend everybody you've got to experiment with your navigation yeah you've got to experiment like honestly chill on the hero experimentation like hero images mm -hmm. you know all that stuff to me is always secondary to navigate navigation's critical and then with mobile obviously the very structure of it predominantly is um is uh hamburger menus so there's a yeah. lot to, to optimize for there i remember when we we launched the bestseller category with you guys um yeah. because we had so many products we we're like how do we even you know, yeah. segment out customers or whatever it is. So what we did was we had best sellers for each category. Yep. So like three products for each category. Um, and if I remember correctly, our like site wide conversion rate is like four to five percent. Yeah. Anybody who entered that bestseller category or collection page, yeah. twelve percent conversion rate. Yeah. yeah. Unreal. Yeah. And you know what's really neat about it is you can also measure other supporting metrics. Like watch this. What I challenge everyone to do is if you have a bestseller page, go create a custom segment, measure it by those who click into the bestsellers page first, and then look at vanity metrics actor. Look mm -hmm. at their pages per session, mm -hmm. engagement time, bounce rates. And what you'll find is they all improve. Yeah. So whether they convert or not, their bounce rates go down, they spend more time on the That's site, right. they mm -hmm. go deeper into the site. Mm -hmm. All of the, the, in theory, prerequisites to a conversion, they do. Yeah. So it's like, there's 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 a lot there, you know what I mean? And I so agree. again, these, these are basic tenets that you can uh, exploit further, especially with your navigation, yeah. so. Going into the next one. So this is actually picking up a lot. I know on our, our last episode, we were going really hard on the getting away from discounting and using scarcity tactics, using urgency, but also value propositions. So here's an example of a brand uh, that sells a, you know, in this case, it's a very high AOV product, right? So this is over a thousand dollar item as an example. Now with this test, the AOV didn't change at all. However, the conversion rate went from two and a half to 4%. Jeez, which wow. is a pretty substantial lift. Now, this is on a very centered audience, right? This was not audience-wide. This was very specifically from paid media, right, mm -hmm. during this experiment. Now, in that, that translates to a pretty big revenue lift. But really what I'm trying to get at here is the difference between the base and the variant is very straightforward. It's centering their iconography around the value proposition right near the actual Add to Cart button on the PDP. This may sound like obvious, but you've got to put yourself into the shoes of the new user. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is I'm a new user. I land on, uh, I see an ad really quickly. I'm you know, in, in between emails and I just jump on Instagram or something. I see an ad, it intrigues me. I click on it. I land on a landing page. I spend eight seconds, right? I progress into say maybe a PDP structure, et cetera. You cannot assume that I've retained virtually any information. You basically have to re-educate me That's on right. really every single page. Yep. You cannot be redundant with great reviews, value props, or scarcity. Mm. You cannot be redundant enough. Go ahead and yep. say it at every single page. Right. I'm telling you, right? Just keep layering it on. Yep. And why this works so well is again, coming back to some basics, you're simply educating the user on why this product exists, to whom is it for, and what problem is it going to solve? I've had a couple clients who came to us who had things like lifetime warranties. And, and you know, you survey a, a small sample set of people who've gone through the site, 20 of them, and like two knew about it. It's like, you, you are literally subsidizing a lifetime warranty, and you mean to tell me that it's not, you know, remember, yeah. you know, like literally 10% of your users knew about it. Mm. And it simply is. And like you go into PDP and it's four scrolls down yeah. written, not even iconography. <laughs> so it's like, use the power of visual iconography and talk about whatever that is. And it doesn't have to be things like, you know, um, it, it, it can also be things that you like you're proud of as an example. Right. So I've got a number of like really fast growing clients that are female founded and there's, and as they should be super proud, they put female that great put that yeah. right on there absolutely right i mean that can only help you yeah. made in the usa you know whatever you got it doesn't like you don't have to worry about what the the value prop icons just highlight what you are proud of about the product right mm -hmm. and, and if you're struggling with this just what i would challenge with you is just go out today 
talk to friends or family and just repitch your product and pay attention to what the core things you keep coming back to. Mm. It's the quality of the ingredient. It's the speed of the manufacturing. It is the materials that we use, right? It is the um, the thought process that went into it, right? Maybe you're in an industry where there's loads of competitors and they kind of just like ship them out and you spend disproportionate, whatever you believe it is, and then highlight that and then mm -hmm. be repetitive and you'd be shocked to see how metrics improve, mm -hmm. you know? So That's a very, great, very great basic too. one, but I, I mean, I see this all all the time, yeah. you know, where you look at a site and you're just like, I don't know exactly what it does or why it exists beyond maybe just existing. I like the way you positioned it. Uh, go and list out what you're proud of about your brand. Yeah. Um, another exercise that we all probably think we do it in our heads, but like go write it down. Yeah. And you'll realize there's probably mm -hmm. so many little things you're not even mentioning. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think on the other side of this is also get your customers to tell you what they like about your brand yeah right? yeah yeah i remember we posted in the community as just like an entry to the giveaway we asked them to comment you know and so i asked them to comment you know what are what are the if you were to explain avi to a friend or family what is the the one thing that you would say to them yeah and all those comments are unreal nuggets that yeah. you can now place on your pdp yeah. your home pages your, your carts etc cetera, etc cetera. so sure. i think you yourself as a founder definitely write those out but get your customers to do it too. Yeah, love it, right? If we go all the way back to the very first episode we ever did together, and it yep. was somewhere buried in there where it's like, pick up the phone yeah. and call, <laughs> call your customers. customers. Yeah. As somebody from yeah. Y Combinators, I forget who it was, it, I think he said famously to the cohort one summer, he was like, You're, you have two jobs, build product and talk to your customers. Mm -hmm. And like, yes, exactly right. All you need to do is honestly focus on talking to your customers and improving the experience, both the virtual buying experience, which is obviously what I focus on, and the actual product itself, right? right? And you continuously do that. Um, and to me, you're, you're, you're destined to, to win there. So um, yeah, I mean, great exercises. You know, I mean, look at like what we do on the conversion optimum, because I test myself on this all the time. And I always come back to some of the key point, because there's plenty of groups out there who will run conversion strategies. Right. And I'll be the first to admit, a lot of them have really nice designs. And a lot of them, frankly, have either identical or very good ideas. The difference is, is they never come from it from a point of metric centricity. Mm -hmm. We're the only group I've ever met that will look at it and say, okay, well, let's look at the data architecture mm -hmm. and the landscape for this brand and identify what are the metrics that matter. Right. Because again, it's like the analogy I use, it's like you look at a home that you need to repair and you're gonna repaint the shutters and there's holes in the roof. It's like, that's not a good use of your resource or time. You kind of missed what the metric on fire was, right. right? So, you know, I look at a lot of brands who will take a look at it and classic example, they'll just dive right into, you know, conversion teams. They'll be like, well, let's just do some landing pages. And it's like, whoa, why, why though? Mm -hmm. Yeah. based on what data point, based mm -hmm. on what hypothesis. So frankly, you know, a lot of the ideas, as you can see, some of the ideas we're coming up with, these aren't like, wow, never been seen ideas before. We just managed to get them right at the right time on the right brands based on our ability to measure the data and, and look at that and, and synthesize it down to where do we action and when. Makes sense. So, yeah. But again, back to the point of like, that is my value prop, right? Mm -hmm. Is that right there? That's what separates us. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so let, let's kind of look at the next one. I, I want to bring this one up. This is another rudimentary one, but I like this because this test can go, can do nothing for you or it can be a nice mover, which is kind of an interesting phenomenon, right? So what it is, is it's very straightforward. It's using sticky add to cart functionality on a PDP with an image of the product. So what I mean by that is if you're on a mobile device and you're on the PDP and you're scrolling down to the review section or the product description section, uh, do you have a little element that sits at like the bottom of the screen that floats with you that has an add to cart functionality and ideally has it with the thumbnail image? Side note, the reason why I say thumbnail image is what we found is if you don't put the thumbnail image, most people forget I know this is insane, what the product looked like, they're about to add a mm, card, so they end up just up. scrolling back up anyways, which kind of defeats the purpose of having a sticky element. So you always wanna have a little thumbnail image of it. But point being is, is we've seen like with this brand right here, a wild return. This was oh, a 19% wow. lift insane. on, this is a very specific audiences who, who went to the PDP on landing. So keep that in mind. These are not audiences who started on homepage. Right. Mm -hmm. They went to PDP on landing. So this was a massive, like, and it had an 11% lift on AOV too. Totally disproportionate that we, we thought Crazy. we'd see. Why? This brand has a product that's a little complicated. 
There's a lot of value props. There's quite a bit of education. There's a whole host of infographics and us versus them and the science behind it. They even show like little regression models mm -hmm. on their PDP. That content, that richness is what sells people. But because there's so much, their PDP is almost like a glorified landing page, like a long form mm -hmm. page. So the people, what we find, is on their page, the land, look, and then scroll down disproportionately lower for longer mm -hmm. than other brands. So for them, it makes absolute sense to have sticky add to cart functionality because it's matching the consumer behavior. You take another brand that maybe sells I don't know, just like a, like a like a standard tea or something like that, that is basically just the aesthetic as an example, people maybe don't have as much of a need to scroll down. Not to say that you wouldn't want to test this feature, but it may not provide much of a lift. Right, you know right. what I mean? Because again, it doesn't match the consumer behavior. Right. So in this case, what we did is we used some heat mapping data and then we used basically some um, what are called non-interaction events. So non-interaction events would be like, well, an interaction event in Google Analytics as an example is like uh, I click on this thing or I enter my, I do a thing, right? But what about if I watch a video to 50%? There's no click action. How do you know? That's yeah. called a non-interaction event. So what we did is we looked at non-interaction events for things like page depth and scroll, and then also how many people would um, basically hover over some of like their little autoplay gifts and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that audience had a disproportionately higher add to cart rate. Therefore, mm -hmm. we suggested, well, let's just make the add to cart behavior easier for them and give them a sticky add to cart. Yep. So again, not a novel idea, no, really. but executed well based on data and based on good empirical measurement and as you can see a way disproportionate lift than you typically see from a feature like this right. so you know beyond just the idea with this case study there's a lot to unpack here based on what ideas to run for which brand at what time based on what data right so mm. you know kind of i think a good example and exemplifies um the process when it's when it's done well so there's certain things again when you talk about uh, the tests you run that fundamentally just make sense like just, just the the fact that you, the, the the topic around showing the thumbnail of what they saw, right? Yeah. Um, I think it just really, really talks through the attention span of consumers today. Yeah. Because, um, like, first of all, we're, we're I, I don't know if anyone's analyzed this, and maybe you have, is like how not just time spent on site, but how fast someone goes through a site. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I don't yeah. even know if that's a metric, and maybe it is. I'd yep. love to know ours, but yep. like. I would have to find it to bet consumers today from three years ago are spending 2x the speed on, on a website. And so that just means that what they can retain is probably far less. Yeah. What they're seeing and then actually acting on and then remembering is probably, you know, is happening at a, a slower rate. So like these little things, although they may seem like, how can that really make a lift? It's, yeah. it's actually getting people to, it's almost being that handicap support. Yep for each consumer because they're moving so fast. Yeah, that it's it's so that's engagement rate in GA4. And this is one of the Got best it. improvements GA4 has is they have session duration and, I'm sorry, engagement time, apologies. They have session duration and engagement time. They're two different Got things. It. Okay. So we had, when we did one of our episodes going yeah. down and breaking down GA4, we talked about that, but that's what you're looking for. Engagement time is a very strict metric. It's basically saying exactly what you think. Okay, forget just how long I'm just sitting here. Cause like, let's assume I actually had on this screen, Avi open right now. Like we've been talking for 20 minutes, yep. 25 minutes. Yeah. In theory, my session duration keeps going. What a great user. <laughs> I'm not paying attention in the slightest. Yeah. Engagement time is literally engaged and it uses, and if you look in the back end of GA4, most users have it set and you should, unless, and I'll get into the second, have it at 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. Meaning if they mm -hmm. haven't moved their cursor, clicked on things or engaged with the site within 10 seconds, no longer engaged. That's a very like, okay, let's, you know, are yeah. you actually engaged, right? Yeah. And what you'll find with most brands, 40 seconds, 50 seconds, a minute, a minute 10, a minute 20, which includes the utilitarian functions of the site, meaning adding to cart, reviewing cart, getting to checkout, entering info. Mm -hmm. All, all the more reason like, so like, where Iconic like, yeah. it has to be so big because no one's reading these humongous paragraphs everyone's no, writing. No, they go <laughs> way too fast. Yes, exactly. I have a general rule of thumb when it comes to copy. If you have a paragraph block with more than three lines, no one's going to read it. <laughs> and I know that's a that's a that's a general thing to say, but like yeah. just trust me on this. Yeah. It's, they're not going to read it. Especially like most sites, and I challenge a lot of people, there's so much to talk about here, but like you get into the whole like branding thing too, where we're like, oh, it looks nice. Yeah, it's size eight font in gray on a white background on a mobile device when the average user doesn't have the best eyesight. Like no wonder they didn't read your best value props. 
Yeah. So another one of those things where again, it's like you just got to look at it through those lenses, which is, you know, and especially if you pertain to an older audience, it even works, mm -hmm. right? Because I mean, they're they're kind of doing this yeah. on the yeah. phone, and yeah. it's like you got this micro font that doesn't even <laughs> pop. So I, I know we're we're dancing around a ton of different things here. Point being is. Um, you know, again, a lot of this comes back to just kind of first principle thinking, mm -hmm. uh, understanding how users are going to interact with the site, uh, understanding how you probably interact with the site, et cetera, um, you know, and making some decisions uh, yeah. supported by your data to, to do that. So um, the last thing I did want to say on the engagement time is uh, everybody on the back end of their GA4 should have that set to 10 seconds unless you are an extremely heavy content site. And the reason why mm. is then you'll you want to use what would GA3 version was called the ABR, the adjusted bounce rate, which basically um, if I land on a, on, a, on a typical blog, right, and I'm reading, more than 10 seconds are going to go by before I do another right. thing because mm. I'm actually reading, right. in which case you do want to adjust that to maybe like 60 seconds. But yeah, for pretty much sense. everybody watching here, you want it at 10 seconds and then go have a sobering look at what that engagement time it's is. Crazy. And it'll probably be, again, 50, a minute, minute and a half at most. Yeah. And that's everything. That's yeah. like the whole thing. Oh, Waiting means... for pages to load, browsing, entering your info. <laughs> that's the whole thing. Yeah. These things so. give you a really good reality check. Yeah. For like the, the way we believe someone's going to consume yeah. our content and copy and our product pages and stuff versus how they're actually. Yeah. And obviously in, in the middle is what we all just lump up as data. Read yeah. your data, know your data. But the truth is, is like the people are just everyone is is consuming information and, and interacting and engaging in a completely different manner than yeah. what I think was even, like I said, like just two, three, four years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, faster, more mobile, yeah, yeah, a lot more competition. Amazon's not going anywhere, we all know that. Yeah. So, um, and then just constant bombardment with ads and buy this, mm -hmm. not that, et cetera. I mean, you, it's classic stuff, right? I mean, yeah. you got very little time to yeah. to, to win uh, their attention. You I know? blame TikTok. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, the nature of it. It's just nonstop, nonstop. feeding you, you just want more and entertainment more and more. at the end yeah. of the day, you know? And, and so, but yeah, I mean, in, in a world that's always, you know, right now talking about, you know, AI and all the crazy advancements that are going on, I, I am still, not that we don't execute on something that we do, but I'm still a big believer of like, you know, the basic tenets and first principles and going back to core understandings of behavioral psych will right. more often than not be your winning ticket, right. you know? And at minimum, just do it, please, so that you can tick those boxes <laughs> and just say that you've ticked those boxes, right. right? You know, right. find a stranger, give them your site, give them 20 seconds and have them sell the product back to you. And yeah. if they miss it, like, you'll get real sobering feedback, of you know course. what I mean? So. I know we went through a few um, examples of different testing that you ran for, for different clients. Um, is there anything specific that you want viewers and listeners to kind of take back and maybe test right away? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the first would be taking your keen look at your navigation. It is disproportionately impactful on your site than you may realize. That's number one. Number two would be understand that, yes, there are some best practices that exist out there, but it's going to be highly deterministic based on who you are in terms of what you sell, who your consumer archetype is, your AOV band, things of that nature. And the last one to kind of take home and to really chew on is go back to first principles, understand the basic tenets of behavioral psychology and ask hard questions of yourself, right? Which is, am I even selling my value propositions here? Chew on that. Chew on that. If you want more from us, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, follow us on TikTok, and check out the website, chewonthis.io.